Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna start us off. You have three presentations today. Um, and to lead us off is going to be uh, Dr. Gary Bergstrom. You see Gary's there. And uh, Gary is our, our resident plant pathologist at Cornell. And Gary's been doing this on, on this Congress longer than I have. So uh, he's a, a staple for corn and for soybean and small grain. And, and today, Gary's going to uh, kind of discuss what's going on in, in the pathology world and give us an update in soybeans and small grains. So Gary, I'm gonna let you start us off. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? I can. Good. Well, I think we're good. Yep, we're good to go. All right, thanks a lot, Mike. I really appreciate the uh, invitation. I always enjoy these meetings. I wish we had a little more interaction but uh, uh, with this format, but hopefully we'll uh, have time for that at the end. I. My purpose today is to, to give you some fairly brief updates about some of the things been happening in uh, soybean and small grain disease uh, diagnosis and management. So uh, I'm in trouble advancing here. Okay, here we go. So some of the things I wanna highlight today, uh, bring you up to date on a little bit about what we're finding on soybean cyst nematode in the state. Uh, some uh, updates on foliar fungicides, particularly uh, looking at uh, resistance in the uh, uh, frog eye leaf spot pathogen. Um, some new findings, uh, I think they're kind of exciting on fungicidal control of white mold and uh, emphasizes on the, on the wheat and malting barley, uh, talking about, again, uh, what we know as best management for fusarium head, head blight and uh, Dion, DON mycotoxin. So uh, we didn't see a tremendous severity of, uh, of diseases in New York State on soybean th this year, but if you look at this long laundry list, a lot of the usual players showed up. Uh, in particular, we'll talk about the kind of expansion in the range of soybean cyst nematode. Uh, white mold, I have highlighted there, but uh, it was not as severe as we, as we thought it might be, and we can talk about that a little bit. Um, we saw quite widely distributed Cercospora leaf blight, which is the same fungal organism that causes purple seed stain. And unfortunately, we saw quite a bit of that in uh, some of the seed lots this year. And related to that, uh, in the seed lots, we saw a fair evidence of Phomopsis seed decay. So let's uh, bring everybody up to date on soybean cyst nematode. Uh, a decade ago, we weren't finding it in New York State. And then for a couple of years, we were finding it only in Cayuga County. Uh, so that has really uh, blossomed in the last few years with uh, extensive survey efforts. And the map in the center shows all the red counties as of 2020, uh, the distribution uh, of the uh, cyst nematode in New York State. And uh, the survey efforts in 2021 have expanded that to three more counties, Oneida, uh, Schenectady County, and Tioga County. And that brings us to a total of uh, 33 counties in the state. So uh, we've been fortunate for the past few decades not to have damage from this uh, nematode, but uh, beware that in most uh, uh, states in the U.S. Where, where it is present and in most countries in the world where it is present, it, it uh, jumps to the top of the list as the number one damaging soybean pest. So it's, it's not a matter of, if, is it coming? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's here <coughs> and now we need to manage it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> wow, sorry. Um, <coughs> so these survey efforts continue. Uh, there's a grant submitted with corn and soybean growers to look at another 75 samples for New York State this coming year. <coughs> and this is uh, headed up by uh, Eric uh, Smith, one of our, um, our uh, field crop educators in the eastern part of the state. <coughs> <coughs> So the slogan of the uh, 
of the uh, Soybean Cyst Nematode Coalition, the National Coalition, to tackle this problem. Their slogan is uh, know your number. And by that, they mean how many eggs of the uh, nematode are in a cup of soil. <laughs> and so it's not just presence or absence, but it's really a problem when we get into moderate to high levels populations of the nematode. And this work is, is beginning now. Uh, you can see this kind of color-coded map here uh, of the, the warm colors, particularly the red colors, like you see in Jefferson County there. Uh, these are indicating that we have soybean soils with, uh, with even high levels of nematode. So this is gonna be very important going forward and knowing your number will be increasingly important. So in the Midwest, where this disease has been uh, problematic for, for several decades now, um, it resist, soybean cyst nematode resistant soybean varieties have, have been very useful practice. Um, the downside of that is that uh, one source of resistance, a plant introduction line 88788, um, is the source of that resistance for most of these commercial varieties. And now uh, the nematode populations are becoming resistant to that plant resistance. And if you see these percentage figures for these Midwestern states, um, you can see that uh, some of them have a rather high percentage that are now uh, the nematode populations in the soil can overcome the resistance in the variety and, and can reproduce. So this uh, slide illustrates all those gray bars. This is by years uh, showing the number of commercial varieties showing resistance. Uh, the gray indicates that this one plant source, 88788, is a source of resistance. Uh, there are other sources of resistance that are coming on slowly now. The Peking source of resistance is one, and there is a, uh, a third source of resistance now, uh, for instance, in some, some of the Golden Harvest and uh, Syngenta lines. So uh, we need to start talking about characterizing the virulence in the nematode population in the sense of what genes in the soybean plant it can overcome and, and the nematode reproduce. So we have, uh, first of all, this HG stands for the genus and species of, of the cis nematode. And we have a virulence type classification here. You see those numbers across the, the top and on the, uh, on the downside on the, uh, the one through seven there shows the different sources of resistance that are known. So what, what occurs is when we get an infested soil sample, uh, seeds of those different lines are planted into the infested soil. And if, for instance, uh, the nematode population can overcome resistance in the 88788 uh, line, it will be designated as HG type 2. If in addition, let's say that it has uh, resistance to the Peking line, then it'll be de designated HG type 1, 2, and et cetera. So the, the early good news is that uh, Dr. Zhihong Wang uh, at the uh, uh, USDA uh, ARS uh, uh, nematology lab at Cornell has typed now two field populations from New York, and both of these <clears throat> were still uh, able to, uh, uh, they, they, they showed to be uh, uh, susceptible, virulent that is, on the PA, PI88788. So at least for the time being, uh, we have some utility in, in the uh, resistance present in many commercial lines. So kind of the, uh, the, the uh, way to look at this is uh, low infestations in the nematode, which is the vast majority of fields now in New York State. Uh, you can choose a high yielding uh, nematode resistant variety to plant and also maintain rotation with non-host crops, particularly cereals and corn. If you know your number and find that you're in the moderate and especially in the high infestation uh, in terms of number of eggs uh, per cup of soil, <clears throat> then you very much need to use a resistant variety. You should do one of these virulence tests uh, and then choose the most suitable resistant variety and continue with rotation 
with non-host crops. So kind of the portfolio of tools here to you. We've talked about some of this, uh, sampling the soils, knowing your number, uh, it being in a good rotation with non-host crops. Um, and increasingly, it's going to be important for us in New York to start uh, growing resistant soybean varieties. And depending on the HG virulence uh, code, we may need to look at other sources of resistance. Um, I will say just a few things about uh, seed treatments. There, there are uh, increasingly now uh, a number of seed treatments being uh, labeled and advertised that have uh, anti-nematode activities. And uh, some of these you may wanna explore in future years. I'm gonna call particular attention to two materials on this list. You'll see Oliva, Olivo kind of in the middle and Saltro at the bottom. Uh, these have shown uh, they are actually fungicides with some reported uh, nematicidal activity, but these two have shown very consistent effect on suppressing uh, sudden death syndrome, a fungal disease, a soil-borne disease that's often associated with, uh, with higher levels of, of the nematode. So this is uh, sudden death syndrome, and I know it's been uh, documented in several places in central and western New York. So just to talk a little bit about uh, soybean fungicides uh, and looking at the Cornell Field Crops Guide, uh, for the first time this year, I added a new fungicide treat seed treatment efficacy table. You may be interested in that. And in the list of foliar fungicides, uh, two new products there for the list, uh, Veltima and Revitec. Uh, this is kind of an interesting observation in much of the South and Mid-South and portions of the Midwest in the United States, uh, one of the principal uh, foliar disease problems, frog eye leaf spot caused by Cercospora fungus uh, is the strobirulin fungicides are, are no longer uh, active against this because of uh, resistance in the Cercospora population. So we thought we'd take a look at this in New York. Um, we, we've got a, a collection of isolates from two places in the state, a field with pretty good infestation in Chautauqua County and one in Herkimer County. And uh, we saw while most isolates uh, that strobilur and fungicides would still be active against, there was significant numbers of resistant uh, individuals in both populations, 21% in one case and 14 in the other. So something to be aware of as we go forward with fungicidal control. Um, want to talk specifically, and we've talked for a number of years about integrated management uh, to suppress white mold, in particular the use of fungicides. And we've identified for you in the past uh, four fungicidal materials that uh, that are consistently show good to very good suppression. And we've talked about uh, application and whatnot. What what I'd like to share with you today. Um, is some sort of finesse recommendations uh, be, coming out of research by a former student of mine and a colleague, Michael Wunsch at North Dakota State University, who's really done some amazingly good work on uh, management of white mold. In fact, Mike, uh, I, I think you might want to consider inviting Michael for a full presentation in another year. But uh, they've had very good control in North Dakota, but Still, uh, growers have talked from year to year. They didn't sometimes get the fungicidal control they expected. So Michael and his colleagues have uh, really done some tremendous field work to try to look at things like optimizing the timing of application of these fungicides. And one of the things they found is a very major factor uh, is whether the canopy is completely closed over uh, at the time of the first flowers, the first flowers in the canopy being denoted as the R1 application stage. And uh, if they look here, you see in this little uh, chart, you see um, non-treated control in terms of white mold and in terms of yield. And uh, they find they get, uh, if the canopy is totally closed over at the time uh, of the R1 stage, uh, then they get uh, 
uh, very good control by applying at that R1 stage. Now, in many, many situations they have found, and I think we would find the same, that uh, at that R1 very first flower stage, uh, the canopy is still fairly open. In this case, they've consistently found it's better to, uh, to defer your first fungicide application. You get more impact on disease and yield to, to uh, defer that first application uh, until the R2 stage. And by that, I mean when the, 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 the flowers are uh, appearing on the, the top two nodes on the plant. So canopy closure is a, is a big factor here. So uh, again, if the canopy is closed at that uh, R2, R1 stage, go ahead and apply your fungicides then. If conditions are otherwise uh, in indicative of, uh, of a, uh, an epidemic that year. Um, on the other hand, if the, if the uh, uh, canopy is, is closed, uh, you should be a, a probably better to defer to R2. So going along with this finesse recommendations, they also made some interesting findings about uh, uh, the nozzle use and spray droplet size, uh, whether the canopy is, is closed over or not. And this is kind of a, a bit of a jumbled slide, uh, but what I'd like to point out from this is if you look at the, uh, at the right hand side, you look at those blue bars, and uh, you were with, with the canopy being fairly open uh, at the R2 growth stage when applying the fungicides, uh, you were getting very good, you get very good efficacy with applying the fungicide with uh, medium sized droplets. But on the far right, as you get uh, canopy completely closed, then you actually did better with a coarse droplet size. And uh, independent of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, PSA, the pressure in the sprayers, the advantage of the larger, coarser droplets is they, they have more weight, more velocity to get down into a closed canopy. And they also bounce around there, get better coverage. So this is, this is very interesting. And uh, I mean, one, one thing with this is that uh, Michael pointed out to me, this particular data set I'm showing you is uh, with uh, uh, T-jet nozzles, but the definitions of medium coarse and very coarse, et cetera, do vary considerably by the nozzle manufacturer. So, so uh, something to be aware of and, and discuss with the, with your suppliers of nozzles. All right, the third uh, thing that Michael took a really good look at here and here is the, uh, the optimizing the application frequency. Uh, and they find in North Dakota that uh, in years locations where there is significant uh, meteorological justification for uh, uh, the risk, of white mold continuing after that first uh, uh, application that they do usually find uh, economic justification for a second application. But when they put that on, um, it, this is kind of interesting and another thing that's a little counterintuitive to me, but if they look at these materials, uh, uh, you know, particularly they did a lot of work with Endura and also with the generics, uh, Topsin type materials. Um, they, they saw that uh, for the uh, lower or the, the uh, really short maturity uh, type soybeans, they, they saw uh, uh, impact on a, on a, long, on a longer uh, interval. And also here you see with the, the uh, generics or Topsin, uh, they don't hold their own in comparison with a single application, but they do work pretty well in combination treatments. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here, still talking about fungicides, but now I'm going to talk about control uh, suppression of fusarium head blight on, on wheat and on, uh, uh, on, on malting barley. And we've participated for quite a while now in a national effort uh, coordinated at Ohio State University of uniform fungicide trials across uh, North America here. And uh, what we've been looking at here 
is the, the main materials that we've had for many years, Caramba and Presaro, and what the impact is applying these uh, at uh, anthesis uh, or applying them earlier than anthesis or later. And uh, so a lot of studies went into this analysis, but what we've consistently found with those materials is the best suppression of, of disease percent control is when we apply those at anthesis, when those first anthers are coming out on, on the majority of heads in the field. Um, and we've got uh, less, less impact when we're applying it before those anthers are out. And in many cases, we can get still very good control for another five to seven days after the start of anthesis if we apply uh, a little later in the game, especially if you look at control of the toxin. So in the last couple of years, the group has started to look at uh, pre-anthesis timing, and particularly uh, because the new product Moravis ACE uh, label allows application at uh, 10.3 on the FEEC scale, which is uh, the heads uh, half emerged uh, from, the, from the boot here. And the materials that we've looked at there include comparing with non-treated. We've looked at Prisaro and Caramba at, at anthesis. Moravis Ace, we've looked at, at, at head emergence and anthesis. And we've also started looking at some uh, two treatment programs where Moravis Ace followed by another fungicide. So uh, these were from the uh, subset of all of those trials that had uh, disease index of greater than two and non-contamination average of treatments of greater than one part per million. And if you look at on the left side, this is the development of visual disease, the FHB index. And on the right shows the, uh, the level of mycotoxin. Uh, keep in mind that most mills are rejecting at two parts per million, what well, flower mills. And if we see here, uh, the, the compared to the check in the red in each case, uh, we see significant reduction in disease and reduction in toxin with each of these application uh, materials and timings. Uh, however, uh, the, the strongest reduction, uh, even with uh, Moravis ACE here, is, is with application at anthesis. Uh, we still get decent control, putting it on a little earlier, but not nearly the control we get, uh, especially for toxin, when we apply it in anthesis or later. So this is brought home with some of the work that we've done in New York State with uh, in this particular graphic with spring barley and with winter wheat in the red, the barley in the, in the blue. Compared to the non-treated levels, this is the levels of toxin in the finished grain. And again, we see that uh, uh, Moravis Ace applied uh, at, the, at the peak timing, which is uh, start of anthesis for wheat and all the heads emerged in the case of barley, we get the best, uh, best control. Um, one thing that is a little different, we've been concentrating there on uh, fusarium head blight and on toxin, but when we look at control of some of the endemic uh, foliar diseases, this is uh, some results on winter malting barley, uh, we can see that in this case, that, that earlier uh, pre-anthesis uh, application um, can be quite helpful on some of these foliar diseases, but we still get very good control putting it on at the peak timing for uh, control of uh, uh, fusarium head blight. Uh, this was some of the recent data we had on winter malting barley this last growing season. Uh, in Aurora, New York. And again, we see here in terms of toxin reduction from non-treated, uh, the Moravis ACE, you said, uh, put on at uh, 10.3, put on quite early. Um, we, get, we definitely get reduction in toxin, but uh, we get much better reduction in toxin with that material applied at, at uh, all the heads emerged. And uh, Prosaro also reduces toxin greatly with all the heads emerged. Um, we also have looked at some of the combination treatments, which do well, but um, may or may not be uh, economical for us. 
Okay, so kind of to sum up our, our state of knowledge in, in this right at this point is that if you're growing winter wheat, the best control of, of toxin and, and disease is to, to spray one of these materials uh, at the, uh, when the majority of the primary tillers in, in your wheat field have anthers extruded. So the 10.51 stage. But if uh, weather doesn't allow you to get in the field or what, whatever thing uh, conflicts with that, if you get an application on in the next five, five to seven days, you're, you're also going to do well. Now we've been talking about for many years, the application of Prisaro and Corumba. Uh, for the last couple of years, uh, we've added Moravis Ace to that portfolio. Um, Corumba will be eventually going out of the marketplace. It's still available right now, uh, but it will be replaced uh, by Spherex, which is now labeled in New York State, uh, to, uh, to play, replace Caramba, so something to be aware of there. Um, and probably within two years, there's going to be a new formulation of, of Prosaro as well. Uh, but for now, Prosaro is uh, what Bayer has present in our marketplace and uh, Moravis Ace uh, with Syngenta. So if we switch gears a little bit to uh, malting barley, uh, it's, it's very much the same story, except the primary best control is application when all the heads are emerged, growth stage 10.5. <clears throat> and again, we can get excellent control for the next five, five to seven days. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the new fungicide Spirex is, is not currently labeled for barley. <clears throat> so Moravis, Ace, and Prisaro are there, and there still is some Caramba for the market in the next year. <coughs> Sorry about my coughing here. <coughs> I'd like to just say a few things about the work on malting barley. And one aspect uh, of, of this work has been cooperating with people like Mike to get out on farms and get uh, samples each year from commercial barley production field of both the spring and winter barley. And uh, we're kind of wrapping up uh, many years of survey here. Especially uh, getting routinely reducing the million. So this, you know, grab bag of samples that's not representing everything in the state, but we've been really doing well over the years increasing the number of, uh, of lots that, uh, that make a malt grade because of low toxin. Uh, where we continue to struggle is with the weather. And I don't have to tell any, any barley or uh, winter wheat grower from this past year that we had terrible problems with, uh, with uh, pre-harvest sprouting. And the game in uh, malting barley is living seed. And we're still struggling, if you can see, see there with uh, uh, only 40% of our commercial lots met germination standards and 95%. Um, it's not maybe as bad as it sounds if we look at the right hand side there, um, still the, the, the median or mean uh, uh, seed lot or, or grain lot uh, did make standards, uh, but uh, even, even reducing from 95 down to 90% germination is problematic going into a malt house. The other thing we've kept a close eye on and another reason to look at fungicidal control is it's not just about the fusarium fungus, but we get all different kinds of molds that, uh, that can uh, have negative impacts uh, in the malting and, and brewing process. And uh, we, we find quite a wide uh, number of uh, fungal genera uh, present in our seed and that we had a lot of moldy seed to deal with this year with all the wet weather before harvest. Uh, one interesting thing uh, that we really do need to keep an eye on into the future with our malting barley is the industry is regulated really basically to look at one mycotoxin, the oxynevolanol or DON, and that's produced by our most predominant fungus, Fusarium graminiarum. But when we've looked at these grain lots, we find that uh, while graminiarum is, is the most prevalent Fusarium fungus, 
we uh, see all of these other fusarium species and some of them uh, have the potential to produce different toxins that we are not currently uh, surveying for, but in the food industry, there's a, there's a sharper look at some of these. So I think we need to be uh, uh, prepared to look at these things going into the future. So Mike, with that, I'd like to pause and uh, open it up to uh, questions from everybody. And I will, yes. stop, I will stop my share. Okay. So we can see each other here. Yeah, so Gary, there is a, a question in the chat box. Okay. Um, in regards to any information on uh, diaporthy diseases in soybeans, had issues this past year. So pod and stem blight, yeah, it was, a, it was an issue. It, it was, and, and you know, I can't say the geographic spread of that. Um, I'd say some hot spots. I don't think we saw it everywhere, but, but the same weather conditions uh, late season that caused a lot of these other problems were, were very conducive for that. Yeah. I, right. you, well, you, yeah, you have any other observations, chat. Mike? You, did you see much of it? In your the fields you scouted, uh, absolutely. In combination with purple seed stain, we yeah. you know it was in every field this year. Uh, so we had white wrinkled up seeds along with the purple seeds, and I gotta say every every yield contest I did uh, across the region this year had some of that. Right. So. Okay. Well, if anybody has questions for me after this, uh, I can put my uh, uh, email in the chat box, and uh, people are free to contact me. So thank you. That'd be great. Gary, thank you very much. Thanks. All right, we're gonna keep on moving. And uh, we have a out of country guest <laughs> with us today. So our next speaker is uh, Joanna Fallings. And Joanna, we have not met in person or really even talked that much, but I hear a lot about you. And uh, Joanna is the cereal specialist up in Ontario for the uh, for OMAFRA, the uh, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Farms, and Rural Affairs. And interesting, Joanna, we had uh, Peter Johnson down here at this meeting in 2011. So what I understand is you know, when he, he retired, you took his position in 2015 or 16? Uh, yeah, 2015. So it's been about seven, eight years, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you got to take over and follow, <laughs> follow Peter. <laughs> Yay. Tough shoes. Well, he's, still, he's still around up there, but I'm sure you, you'd still talk to him and see him quite a bit. Yep. Um, but Joanna, yeah, so she is really kind of looking at, you know, high management wheat up in Ontario. And I know there's probably over a, a million acres of wheat uh, up in that region, very much more than 125,000 acres that we do here in New York. But Joanna's going to talk a little bit about what she's doing up there, uh, talk a little bit about the Yen, the Yield Enh Enhancement Network that she's kind of spearheaded up there. And also talk about some other uh, pretty good research projects that I think will be very pertinent to our growers down here. So, Joanna, I'm going to let you take over. All right, great. Thank you so much, Mike. And you guys can see my screen okay? There's no... Yep, we can nothing. see it. Okay. It's perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm actually really excited to be talking about this topic, uh, high management wheat in the Great Lakes region. And what I thought I would do is I was would go through, talk to you all a little bit about the Yield Enhancement Network, what that all entails, and then from there talk about uh, two other projects that are going on that I think might be interesting uh, to some of you folks. And so we'll just uh, get right into it here today. So, oops, I can't seem to get this to go forward. All right, there we go. Uh, so first up, I wanted to talk about the Great Lakes Yield Enhancement Network. And so what the YEN or the Great or the Yield Enhancement Network is, uh, so it's actually an initiative that was started by ADAS, which is uh, essentially the equivalent to the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food, but in the UK. And they started this back about 10 years ago with the goal of connecting farmers, CCAs or agronomists, uh, grower organizations such as uh, the Grain Farmers of Ontario or Michigan Wheat in, the, in this year's case, uh, as well as academics. And it's really to come together to close the gap between the actual yields we're getting on farm and what we think potential yields could be or should be on farms in the region. 
Uh, and so this was done by benchmarking farms and evaluating how each of those farms or each of those uh, individual metrics, and you're going to see we collected a lot of metrics or looked at a lot of metrics, and how those uh, fared against one another and what areas they could, uh, you know, improve on in the future, or even identify the areas that they're doing really well with their management. And so it's really uh, what I would say is the, the key component of this is, is peer to peer learning. And it's the growers willingness and ability to share their information with each other and, uh, and learn from one another. So it's uh, really cool to see the growers coming together and working on this together. And so I, what I really want to highlight with this initiative is it's not just like a one person leading this. This is really a huge collaboration. I've never been involved in a collaboration quite like this. So uh, in Ontario, we came together with myself at the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, as well as my colleagues in our GIS unit who helped us with some database uh, and, and, and uh, data um, analysis, sorry. And then we also had the grower organization with Grain Farmers of Ontario and a lot of their staff helped us with the communications, the financing, and, and some of the general project management. We also have the CCAs, so the Certified Crop Advisors are also involved and they're heavily engaged through the growers themselves and are helping on farm collect this data and helping growers actually understand what the reports that I'm gonna to get to actually mean. And then of course on, uh, oh, and then we've got the University of Guelph. So we've got Dr. Dave Hooker and Dr. Josh Nzelski who help us with the modeling. So they help us model and determine the yield potential on each of these growers farms. And then we've got our folks in Michigan State. So we've got Dennis Pennington, which I think many of you are probably familiar with as well as Michigan wheat growers who are also extremely pivotal in this. And so you can see here, there's a lot of people, it's not just me. We're a pretty large team uh, and everyone plays a really important role. And so for an initiative like this to happen, uh, you really need to come together uh, to make something like this uh, come to fruition. So I thought I would just highlight what we did in 2021, how we started and then where we're gonna go in 2022, as well as some of the key trends and things that we identified this past year. So we had 43 fields across the, the Great Lakes region, which included Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio. And we had 23 sites in Ontario. Now, the 23 sites in Ontario were very specific to Southern Ontario, simply because we did all the data collection and data analysis ourselves. We didn't really depend on the growers to do that this year, but that's gonna be different for 2022 and going forward. And the same with Michigan, they kind of kept it in a, you know, put certain fields in, in close together or within certain regions just to be able to get there and collect the data. Uh, but again, we're hoping to expand across the, the provinces in the region uh, just so that we can get more soil types, growing conditions, uh, all those sorts of things. And so for each location, what we ask of each grower is to select an area of the field that is fairly representative. So we're not getting, you know, we're not getting too deep into precision egg yet or even looking too much across different soil types within a single field. Uh, so we're just asking growers to select a one to three acre area in the field. We flag that off. And then within that area, we've got 10 spots that we go and sample throughout the entire season. And so we have a soil sample that we do before any nitrogen or any nutrients are applied. Uh, and this helps us a lot with uh, better understanding things like soil texture, of course, all the soil available nutrients, um, but some of the soil components actually go in and feed the model that we determine yield potential. So it's a pretty important component. We also do tissue testing at growth stage 31 uh, or first node. So once that crop reaches first node, it's starting to elongate. We collect a tissue sample then as well as at flag leaf. And with that, then we look at all the nutrient content. So sulfur, potassium, calcium, everything that is in the tissue uh, tests we look at. Uh, this year we're going to be adding a couple of other things like sugars to see how sugars influences nutrient content in the plant. Um, then we also collect uh, right before harvest. So once the crop reaches physiological maturity, we go out and we collect 100 shoots from each of those one to three acre plots and we rip them apart. We measure the height, the weights, we count spikelets per head. We get all of the details and all of the components of each of those shoots. 
Uh, and then we also get a grain analysis. So we do yield, we do a grain analysis for both nutrient and quality. Um, and then we also get, you know, we weigh off the yields and, and look at to see what the highest yields are. And then we also have weather data, which is another huge component. We're currently using the NASA power data. And so for folks who might know that it's an open source weather data. And uh, with that, we collect maximum minimum daily temperatures, the amount of rainfall that's received as well as solar radiation. And solar radiation for this uh, particular project is really important for us to, again, help determine yield potential. And we're able to see how much that crop is actually capturing in terms of solar radiation. So we collect all this data uh, through uh, an online platform. So this is what a grower would see. And so they would go in, they'd enter all of their agronomic information, everything from planting right through to harvest. So your seeding dates, your seeding rates, but also the nitrogen you applied, the types of seed treatments you use, PGRs, all sorts of things. And then at the end of the season, this is what this basically, <laughs> this data set looked like for 43 farms. So lots and lots of data, um, but as a grower, you see this and think, oh, this could be overwhelming. And so what we do is we then take this and generate a customized individual report for each grower. So this is what that report essentially looks like. And in this final report, each grower gets a summary of how their field ranked. So what, how they ranked for yield. So there is a, a competition component. So the highest, we're looking for the top yielding growers, but also looking at the top three growers that have the highest yield potential. And that yield potential number comes from us collecting this data and plugging it into a model, which then tells us based on the weather, the growing conditions, uh, the soil type, the, you know, when the crop was planted, this is the yield that they theoretically should have gotten. And so the folks that had the, the highest percentage of their yield potential were also ranked. And so each grower can kind of get a sense of how they, how they fare. Uh, but in the report, it's about a 20 to 20, two page report. Uh, and you can see here on the right, you know, this is just an example, a screenshot of one of the pages that looks at some of the metrics. So a grower can see how they compare, uh, you know, this is the form of nitrogen they applied, but here is what the rest of the folks in the project they applied. Same with history of new applications, you know, seeding dates, nutrients, all that sorts of thing. And we do this uh, through these graphics, which are called uh, box plots. So again, you can see everything from, from crop nutrition postmortem uh, to, to all the yield components. And so actually, I maybe should have explained what these box plots were uh, first. So how we analyze or benchmark the growers is, is through these uh, little graphics here called box plots. And this yellow value or this yellow dotted nut line, a grower that is there uh, where they stand. So say this was 135 pounds of nitrogen that they applied. Uh, they would see that there. The green line shows them where the top 10% of growers, so the top highest yield potential of growers, that's where those folks you know, landed on average. This is the lowest value of that particular metric, the highest value, and then the middle 50%. So for example, if we look at total biomass here, this grower, he, you know, had uh, 17,000 pounds of biomass per acre. You know, it was much higher than the top 10%, which is excellent. But then you could see, you know, other growers had less than 10,000 pounds and some growers had well over 20,000 pounds. So you can see the range, but you can also see where, where you rank. And so, uh, each grower got one of these reports. Uh, like I said, it's 20 to 23 pages. Um, and so now what I would like to do is kind of dive into, so, uh, you know, again, not every grower is going to have the same results, but I'd kind of like to dive into from the research perspective of what some of the trends were and, and some of the things that we observed on these 43 farms. So on average, across the entire region, so across these 43 sites, we had an average of 115 bushels per acre. Now, I think that's pretty phenomenal. If we look at our provincial average in Ontario, we're, we're in the 80s. Um, so this is quite a bit higher than our provincial average, which is great to see. Uh, but what's really interesting is that our actual our average yield per potential was 220 bushels per acre. So we're only obtaining about 50% of our potential in the region. Now, obviously the yield potential on each individual farm is going to vary. 
Uh, there's things like rainfall. If you don't get rain, obviously that's going to be a huge factor. There's also going to be differences depending on soil type. So whether you are on a clay soil or a more sandy soil, that's also going to factor into that. But all in all, we're at about 50% of our potential. And this is pretty in line with what they're finding in the UK. Uh, in the last 10 years, they've had they've been able to push that average up. So, you know, in some cases they're at, you know, 70% uh, of potential on some of these farms. And I don't remember if it was 2021 or 2020, I apologize, but uh, they actually had some growers meet their yield potential or actually get slightly higher. And so now they're having to figure out, okay, well, what, how are these growers getting higher than what we think their potential is? So it's just a way for growers to see, you know, where they stand, what their potential is, and then we wanna try to close that gap between actual yield and potential yield. So this is just a snapshot of one of the growers participants from this past year. And this grower was actually our highest yielding grower. And so I've highlighted a couple of key metrics here because total biomass, uh, the amount of nitrogen in the straw and in the grain, as well as heads per meter square, tended to be the most uh, trending towards higher yields. So if we had a very high biomass, we tended to see higher yields. Uh, same with the total nitrogen uptake and heads per meter square. And so you could see here, Kevin had a fairly high, he was higher than the top 10% for biomass. He was on the high end for the amount of nitrogen applied. And he also had a very high heads per meter squared. So his average yield, the top yield of the competition was 152 bushels. And again, our average was 115. So just to give you a little bit of that reminder there. And he was actually able to achieve 64% of his potential. So that's, uh, his potential was 248 bushels per acre, and he was able to achieve 61% of that, which is pretty awesome. And what I wanna point out here is the amount of rainfall that he received. So we looked at both soil available water. So what the amount of moisture your soil is giving you based on your soil type and your soil texture. And then we also captured rainfall data. And so he got you know, pretty consistent rain throughout the season. And I was just looking at his weather data just last week actually. And one thing that I noticed is that he was also getting fairly timely rains through the grain fill period. And I think that was really critical um, and a key part of him achieving some of these higher yields. And you could see, you know, it's, he's not really using, you know, what I would consider out of this world management. I mean, he's using minimum till after soybeans. He did seed it a little bit later than his optimum date for this region. So for his region, the optimum date is around September 25th to September 30th. So slightly later than what we would like to see, but he did bump up his seeding rate a bit to account for that. Uh, he split applied his nitrogen and he used a PGR and one fungicide application. Disease in this field was pretty low throughout the whole season. And the fungicide was at pollination or anthesis to help deal with fusarium head blight. Now, uh, looking, so Kevin was our highest yield. So we had a high yield category and then we had a high percent of yield potential category. And in this category, the top percent potential was Jeff Crone from Michigan. And so Jeff, uh, you know, comparatively to Kevin, Again, he had a little bit of a lower biomass. He also had a lower amount of nitrogen applied and a lower heads per meter square. Um, but what I'll get into a little bit here is with this heads per meter square, um, we're really seeing some interesting stuff with that. And in that, if you tend to have lower heads per meter square, we tend to see higher yield components. So higher test weights um, or spikelets per head, those sorts of things compared to where we've got very high heads per meter square, we tend to see a little bit lower on the yield component side of things. And so those are some of the trends that we're seeing there. But again, Jeff, he, he achieved 140 bushels per acre. So again, quite a bit higher than the average and his potential modeled on this site based on the growing conditions, all those sorts of good things. He had a potential of 190. So he got 73, almost 74% of his potential, which is, which is pretty awesome to see. And what's interesting comp compared to Jeff and Kevin is that uh, Jeff had a quite a bit less rainfall uh, than, than Kevin. So he had about 200 millimeters less. Um, and I'm gonna touch on that a little bit uh, here too. Again, nothing you know overly uh, out of the norm in terms of management, minimum till he planted it very early. He had the opportunity to do that because he was planting after edible beans. 
and he put down what I would consider to be a pretty typical or standard uh, nitrogen rate of 130 pounds per acre. In Ontario, we're using a standard of about 120 and for just to give you perspective, and I'm talking about actual units of nitrogen, a standard is about 120 to 130 whereas some of the high managed growers and particularly hard red wheat growers are, are pushing much higher at 150, 160 pounds of N. So um, these two growers are really within what we would consider like our optimal or our standard range for, for management. And so those are the top two growers. And what I'd really like to get into now is uh, more of a bird's eye view of all of the growers. So you can see what the top two growers did there. And now we'll see what this, how this all played out across all of the 43 locations. And so the, the, the key components that were really trending towards high yield was the amount of nitrogen applied, but in particular it's, or sorry, the nitrogen applied, but specifically the amount that was applied and the timing of that. And Pete Berry from ADAS from in the United Kingdom will tell you this is extremely critical and it's very critical for their growers. Uh, and nitrogen timing and actually applying it when the crop needs it and when the loss or the risk for loss is minimal is, is crucial to, to optimizing your nitrogen management heads per meter square, high heads per meter square was also highly correlated to yields as well as a high total biomass. And the other interesting part, and I'm gonna to touch on this again, is the crop protection timing versus spend. Uh, there definitely needs to be a lot more attention to detail when it comes to timing our crop protection products, whether that be a PGR, a fungicide or an, a herbicide, uh, and even insecticides. We found that just because you spend you know, so much uh, per acre on your crop protection, if you're not timing that properly, it really doesn't matter. And so that was something that uh, really came out and we'll, we'll dive into that next year. So what I've, what I've put together here for you, I've pulled out some of the key components or the key data points that we thought were of interest when comparing those growers that were above that 150 bushel average uh, and those that were below that. And so you can see here that for seeding rate, for example, growers who were getting those higher yields, they were planting on average almost four days earlier. And to you, you know, four days might not seem like a lot, but four days, uh, you know, we're looking at an average of 1.1 bushels loss per day for every delay day we delay planting. So that, you know, four days very quickly starts to add up. Uh, and as you get to 10 days, you know, you can quickly see that you're diminishing your yield potential rather quickly. They were also using a much lower seeding rate, and I should say much lower, but 140,000 seeds per acre on average lower. Uh, so again, I think that plays into seeding date, seeding earlier, we don't tend to need as much a high of seeding rate because we get lots of time for those plants to develop tillers in the fall. Seeding, seeding depth was fairly consistent. Nitrogen applied, generally we're applying a bit more nitrogen slightly lower on the sulfur front, which was also, again, a little bit interesting there to see. We tended to have more split applied uh, nitrogen in the above growers versus the below. And this is where I get into that crop protection spend. So we had a qu quite a bit of higher, almost $7 higher per acre on our crop protection spend. But then when we broke that out on a bushel basis, uh, growers were actually spending less on their per bushel compared to those growers that were below that 115 average. Um, again, they were achieving a much higher percent of yield potential. They also tended to have a higher thousand kernel weight. They also had higher grains per head and heads per meter squared and grains per meter squared. Um, so those are some of the interesting things. And we also tended to find that they had a, a slightly longer grain fill period which really plays into building up our yield components um, in the crop. And so, you know, we look at seeding date, as I mentioned, you know, just having those 3.7 to four days earlier, you get much quicker canopy closure. And we definitely saw that in the springtime. And that's really going to influence the amount of solar radiation you're capturing. So we're looking at trying to achieve 70% solar capture um, or from green up through to anthesis and then basically from anthesis on we're looking to you know 90 90 plus percent so this is is really critical in getting that quick 
quick canopy closure. It's also critical for fall tiller development. So if you're a grower and you're, you're you know, kind of scratching your head and asking yourself, how do I get more yield? You know, <laughs> I think planting date is one of the lowest hanging fruits that we tend to neglect. And fall tillers is, are more yield. We, the tillers that come in the spring don't tend to produce you know, a viable head that really contributes to yield. We're really looking for those fall tillers, uh, those main stems in the fall to give us that yield. So that's really key there. And then, like I said, we have a higher spend per acre, but lower uh, spend per bushel. So it's just that attention to detail. So if we've got a late planted crop or these growers had a later planted crop, you know, that doesn't really tiller in the fall, they're putting on a little bit of nitrogen at green up and then they're coming back, you know, at stem elongation with the remaining amount and they're splitting that out. They're feeding that crop slowly and same with the high, higher yielding growers. If they've got a huge canopy there, kind of like that, that photo I showed at the beginning, we don't really want to feed it too much nitrogen at green up. We want to sort of delay that a little bit because we need to manage lodging. And we also need to make sure we can actually sufficiently support those tillers in the long run. And then the other interesting piece I wanted to just pull out and highlight here. Uh, so PGRs are fairly new. I shouldn't say that. They're not really new to Ontario, but we've got some new products that are available now. And so within that, uh, we actually found that 65% of farms uh, in that upper half of, of high yielding growers did use a PGR. And so we felt like this was maybe an indication of the size of the canopy. Um, and again, we know that, or we've identified that tall crops with high straw nitrogen and high grain nitrogen correlates to big yields. So those are just some of the interesting pieces that I just wanted to highlight for you there. Now, if we dig into the yield components, um, what we've got here on the bottom is the European targets. So these are actually from ADAS and this is what they're, they're trying to chase after. And again, the above and below 150 bushels per acre growers, again, we just tend to see a, a higher 1,000 gram weight or 1,000 kernel weight. We also have a higher grains per head. So that was critical that the actual number of grains on each head was much higher. We had a higher heads per meter square um, and a higher uh, grains per meter square. And when you look at the UK components, what is very interesting to me is that we are much higher on the heads per meter square and even the grains per meter square are almost double, but we're a lot lower on our actual kernel size and kernel weight compared to the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's a product of our grain fill period. They have a much more consistent, um, ideal growing conditions for grain fill. It's cool, nighttime temperatures are cooler, Whereas in Ontario and Michigan, Ohio, and in New York State, as you all know, we can get those 30 degree days during the grain fill period, and that can shorten that up very, very quickly. And we suspect that that's maybe where we could potentially be losing some uh, ground in terms of our yield components. And then we also looked at things like crop protection. I, I know I've talked about this a few times. Um, and so we actually had a, quite a bit of farms only use one fungicide application. I, I didn't really know how this data was going to play out. I was very curious to see how many growers are using a fungicide and when they're using them. And interesting enough, we had 14 farms only use one application. And I, I should back up a little bit. So 2021, uh, since, ever, since I've been in this role, I have never seen powdery mildew pressure the way we saw powdery mildew pressure this year. It was very, very high. And so we saw quite a bit of growers out applying a T1 fungicide for that. Um, only a few growers applied just a T2, so that's at flag leaf. And then the majority of the single applications were that T3 or that anthesis timing to protect against fusarium head blight. Now the growers that did multiple applications for farm, uh, the most number of multiple applications was the, the early application to protect against powdery mildew, and then that T3 or flowering application to pr protect against fusarium head blight. We had a few folks that had to do T2. Again, it depended on when the powdery mildew showed up. Uh, some growers did apply three, and there was two growers uh, in Michigan, I think, or Ohio, that had to apply a fungicide last fall because of the amount of 
disease pressure and the canopy size that they had. So that was interesting. But this year, uh, we actually saw that the three fungicide or three past fungicide program was the highest yielding, which surprised me a little bit. Although we had high powdery mildew pressure, um, the, the weather wasn't super conducive for a lot of disease because we did have a very, very dry period there um, between May and June. So that was just interesting to, to see some of those trends. Now, with this program or with this initiative, you can see that we're looking at a lot of metrics, a lot of data, um, but there are obviously going to be some limitations. Uh, in, in what I showed you here just now, one of them is the fact that we just have one year. So this was our first year of data. So everything, the trends that we're looking at and some of the conclusions we're, we're drawing out of that is really limited to one year data. And we know, uh, and you all know, weather in particular varies so much from year to year. So it'll be interesting to see as we layer on multiple years, what, um, you know, how that actually eventually plays out. There's a risk for data collection errors. Uh, when we reported back to growers, gave them their, their final report, you know, we'd get a few folks say, oh, you know, actually, I actually put this amount of nitrogen on when I went back to my records. And so, you know, there's some of those things that are, aren't perfect, but um, in the future, we're hoping to continue to tease that out. The NASA power weather data set that we use is not farm specific. Excuse me. So this year we really looked at weather data across the region and used the NASA power data, but it's a very wide, like it's a very wide uh, radius that it covers for each individual point. And so we did have a few growers that had some weather data, uh, weather stations. So we actually are in the in the midst of comparing that weather station data to their NASA power data to see if that more um, specific weather from the field is going to create some differences in the model. And then the other thing that we also had to do was assume the amount of water used across by the wheat crop. So we assumed it was equal across all farms. So we assumed 20 millimeters per 15 bushels. And this is a, a number based on um, you know, previous research, research that's done in the UK as well. And so this one, again, could vary from farm to farm, but unfortunately, we just don't have the ability to, to be as specific with this particular model. So in terms of going forward, uh, we want to continue to build our data set year over year. So 2022 is launching another year. So as time goes on, what we're really hoping to get out of this is not only to have growers get a better understanding of their what their management decisions, how that's influencing their yields uh, and their profitability, but we also want to be able to take this information and get a better sense of what those tissue values actually mean. So in Ontario and Michigan anyways, there are some, you know, for anyone who's doing tissue testing, you get results for some of these nutrients. I'm going to use boron as an example. And boron itself has a lot of chatter in, in, in its values. And so you get that value and you're not really sure what to do with it. Um, so our goal is to be able to, over time, as we build this data set, actually be able to come up with some critical thresholds and values for some of those nutrients we don't really use very much or tend to look at a lot. We also want to be able to develop more robust recommendations on management, whether that's seeding dates or seeding rates. Um, crop protection inputs will be able to hopefully better guide growers with this data set and say, hey, these are the things that we see and these are the areas you should focus on. And we just want to get a better understanding of the factors limiting our yield in the Great Lakes Basin. So um, it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots, I think, to come out of this. And in the 2022 season, we are doubling the number of grower participants. We had 43 last year. We have 56 already confirmed in Ontario, and then there's going to be 50 plus planned in Michigan, Ohio, and New York. And I think there might even be a couple from Kentucky. Um, we will have an improved data collection platform. So we're gonna have a little more intuitive of platform that's gonna be used long-term. The one we used this year was kind of a quick put it together so that we could get through the season, but now we've got one that's coming up that's gonna be much more um, user-friendly. 
And we're also looking at additional parameters on soil and tissue tests. So we did a, at the end of every, at the end of the end, we do a grower meeting where we announce the award winners for highest yield and yield potential, but it's also to go, we, we essentially talk about everything that I'm talking about with you today and growers can ask each other questions. Uh, they can, you know, really focus in on areas that they want to improve on. And it's a, it's a really great networking uh, event. And at that, this past year, we heard from folks that they would really like some additional soils parameters. Um, so for example, we're gonna look at things like sugar levels and tissue, leaf tissue samples to see, you know, does that dilute the nutrient content in the leaf? Uh, we also wanna look at the amount of mineralization happening from the soil. So a colleague, Sebastian Billiard, uh, he's gonna kind of lay our soils project on to help us dive into some of that. And in the future, if we find that this is useful information and the growers are um, excited to have it, we'll continue to add that stuff in. Uh, I was also able to work with colleagues Jocelyn Smith and Tracy Bowdy, and at each of the Ontario farms, we monitored armyworm flight and cereal leaf beetle populations throughout the entire growing season. So we would go out and monitor those traps and do some scouting. And um, so we were actually able to layer some other projects on top of this, which was a very uh, great outcome. And so growers got a little bit more information from that. And then for 2022, um, we're going to continue that and then we're going to actually have our grower kickoff on the 25th of February. So I know uh, Michigan is still drumming up some interest for some growers as well as if there's anyone here today that's interested. I know from the Michigan side of things, Ontario, our applications are closed, but on the Michigan side of things, they're still looking to take applications up to February 23rd, I believe it is. So if you're interested, um, there might still be some opportunity there to have you on board and have you engaged. Growers will be required to collect their own tissue soil test this year. So I, Dennis and I and our students did that last year, but with the number of sites in the geography, that's just not gonna be possible. So there's gonna be a little bit more reliance on growers, um, but for the most part, they, the growers know that and they're aware and they're excited to be engaged. So that's sort of what the yen is about. Um, and I guess uh, I still got a few more minutes here. So I'm gonna jump into a couple other initiatives quick that you may have heard about uh, that we were working on this past year. And one of them uh, that's a little bit, was a little bit near uh, to my heart was actually this drill demo project. Uh, and how this drill demo project came to be was, my family, we are farm, we are dairy and cash crop farmers. And we were, we run an old sunflower 10 inch row drill. So, you know, as a cereal specialist, I shouldn't say that, but that's what we were running. And so the question we had on our farm was, okay, so we've got this drill. We know that we could do better. What's the most economical way to, to do better, to get weed into the ground, to optimize our yield at, you know, at seeding, at planting, when we have older equipment, like what is, you know, and that's, that's a lot of growers are asking the same question. And so that kind of then evolved a little bit more into, well, do these high performance drills pay or should you look at a custom operator to see your force technology and some of that downforce, um, you know, technology, is it worth it? And then also what about mesen map? Because we know phosphorus and seed place phosphorus pays, but there's some of these new products with these micro essential nutrients. And so girls were wondering, well, does that pay as well? So the, the project kind of evolved from a simple question to, to a little bit more. And so what we did is we had brought out four drills. Uh, so we've got this 10 inch sunflower drill, this new Borgo drill, uh, this is a Western Canadian technology. They tend to have much larger models of this version uh, and they've created a bit of a smaller version for Ontario. Then we just had a, you know, seven and a half inch, your typical no-till John Deere drill. And I didn't picture it here, I apologize, but it's very similar to this uh, John Deere drill, except it's equipped with cedar force. So it's equipped with that down pressure to keep that seeding depth consistent across the field. And so uh, you can see here, so these are all the drills that we used, uh, the four drills, but then we use them in combination with different fertilizer um, combinations. So uh, we had no starter was our, was our base check compared to everything had hundred pounds of map or we used hundred pounds of mez. And then we also, with the, the sunflower drill, because it doesn't have its own fertilizer box, we mixed the seed uh, and the same with the John Deere, we mixed the seed directly with the map. Um, at safe rates. 
And so this was seeded after corn silage. And for us, we don't, we grow soybeans, but we don't grow edible beans. And uh, our soybeans we were finding were coming off too late. And so we were looking for a way to get it in the rotation sooner and get it planted sooner. And so while not ideal, we plant it always after corn silage. Uh, you know, that's fusarium risk, but we always use a variety that's resistant to fusarium or has high resistance. And we always plan to use a T3 fungicide. So that's sort of how we manage that. Um, so we use Pioneer R61. And this, what I want to highlight, and this is extremely important when you see the results, is that this history has awesome rotation. It's got corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa. It has dairy, it has hog manure. So we have very high P and K values, high organic matter levels. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through some of this data. And you can see here this photo on the left. This is our 10 inch um, spacing. So this is the sunflower drill. And this is the, on the right is the downforce cedar force pressure with the John Deere drill. And I, I don't know if you can quite see it on the screen. I should have made these a little bit bigger, but you can see that with the sunflower drill, there's a lot less consistency. So if, as we go over those root balls or other uh, residue in the field, um, you know, that, that drill was not able to cut through that residue. We've got spots where plants are actually missing. Whereas where we had the cedar forest, we tended to have a much more consistent stand. We didn't have those gaps and it was actually able to cut through those root balls uh, quite easily. So that was something that, you know, right out of the gate in the fall. So these are from the fall. Uh, this was taken in November last in 2020, 2020. Uh, so you can see there's, there's quite the difference already just in the fall between the canopy closure and the consistency of those plants. We did apply a spring fungicide and a T1 fungicide or herbicide, uh, as well as a T1 fungicide because we were dealing with powdery mildew. Uh, and then we also put a fungicide on a T3 for uh, Fusarium head blight. We put 150 pounds of nitrogen on, we used a PGR and the crop was harvested uh, at the end of July. But what I wanna highlight, so this field essentially had no rainfall from about May 20th until June 25th. And on June 25th, we had a massive rain and windstorm come through Southern Ontario and pretty much all the wheat or big wheat in Ontario went down and looked like this. So it was quite flat. Uh, so the combine operator, AKA my brother uh, was very happy with me uh, to get to harvest this plot. Um, but the results were quite interesting in that there was absolutely no statistical yield differences across any of the treatments. So to st statistically, all of these yields came out as being equal. Um, same with the falling numbers, you can see because we had that lodging and, and Gary mentioned this earlier that there was just a lot of sprouting this year. And we had that here too. Uh, once, pretty much once July came, it didn't stop raining. It was very, very difficult to get into fields and get the crop harvested. And when you have a lodged crop, it takes that much longer to, to dry down as well. So our falling numbers were quite a bit low as well, but our yields were, were the same across treatments. And so my thoughts on this uh, is that, one, number one, it was planted early and well within our optimum planting date for our region. And so I think that that just reduced the variation we would have seen between those treatments. If, if all of them are planted early, it has lots of opportunity to tiller in the fall. We just didn't quite see that difference. We have good soil test levels, good rotation. And of course, this lodging, and you can see this was a drone photo we took. The lodging, I think, had an overall impact on yield results. And on the left of this field, so along this road here, that's where, where some of the cedar forest uh, uh, strips were. And I, I wonder if just the timing of the lodging you know, could have played a role in those maybe giving them lower yields. So this is one year, I would say, you know, in Michigan, they've got lots of awesome work on this with Dennis Pennington and Manny, and they're finding that there's definitely an advantage to some of this technology. And so this is something we want to continue to explore. Um, but it was just a really interesting project to sort of follow along and, and see what, what came out of it at the end. And so when we looked at the cost benefits of this, using in our scenario, we had that sunflower drill, all we needed to go from, if we just went from a seven or 10 inch to seven and a half inch rows, 
Uh, we just need two bushels per acre to pay for the price of renting a drill that allows us to do that. So for folks out there who are in the similar boat, maybe you've got an older drill, wider row spacings, you know, you really don't, it doesn't take much to, you know, pay back that rental or, um, yeah, or hiring a custom operator uh, to do that for you. Again, these are Canadian dollars, uh, so this will be, and it'll obviously vary depending on what the custom rates and rental rates are for your area. And, uh, you know, that's an $8 wheat. Uh, right now it's, you know, wheat last week was nine twenty dollars here. Uh, so at $5 wheat even, that only takes an extra three bushels. So although the yields weren't, you know, overly statistically different this year because of the lodging, we felt that there was enough of a, we saw an advantage. And so we are, we continued to plant all our wheat this past year in seven and a half inch rows. And we're very excited to see how that plays out this year. Then when we looked at the Cedar Force technology, it's about $900 per row unit uh, with labor plus labor. And again, this is Canadian dollars. So it would cost approximately just under 11,000 plus labor if you had a 12 inch or 12 row drill to equip. Um, that's how much it would essentially cost you. So again, you'd have to sort of work out those numbers on your own operation. But if you're interested in seeing, we did a, a whole series. Uh, it was about six or seven wheat school videos. So I've got the link here. But if you go to agri realagriculture.com and you look up wheat school, we've got a whole series on this project. And you can see all of the photos and see all the things that we really dumped, dived into and focused on. And you can get some more information on that. Um, and I would also encourage you to take a look at Dennis Pennington's work in Michigan because there's some really interesting results coming out of that too. So that was the drill demo project. Um, and quickly here, because I know I don't have a lot of time left, I thought I would talk about another project uh, that's being led at the University of Guelph with Dr. Dave Hooker and Dr. Josh Nazelski and uh, Emma Dillman here at the University of Guelph. And we've got some fairly older planting date data in Ontario. And so it was really time to get some current planting date information and how that impacts yield formation. So Emma is working on this. So her second year of this data or of these plots are, are in the ground. And essentially what, what Emma is looking at is wanting to quantify the effects of planting date and management on our overall growth and yield formation. So we in Ontario have a very detailed planting date map uh, range for the area, but we really wanted to know, okay, so what if I plant ultra early uh, versus ultra late? Or what about the middle timings? Like really where is that cut off when it comes to yield formation and optimizing our yields? And then we also wanted, or she also wanted to take a look at, you know, what about soybean desiccation? Uh, you know, we really struggled to get those soybeans off early and in good time. So what about desiccation uh, to see if we can get those harvested a little bit earlier? Because again, five days in the fall doesn't seem like a lot, but as you know, the weather in the fall can be so unpredictable and you can have a beautiful week, but then the next week it can be raining every day. So that five days can often turn into 10 days or even longer. So she wanted to see, are there things we could do with our soybean crop to get that wheat planted earlier? And so again, she's got the second year of plots in the ground. Uh, there's four seeding or planting date timings. So early uh, in September to early October is the mid early to mid late for October, November, and then late late was pushing it for November, December. Um, so Ridgetown is more in the, the, the most Southern part of the region of Ontario, just uh, on the shores of Lake Erie there. And Exeter is uh, more North central Ontario on the shores kind of of uh, Lake Huron. And so even just in these photos here, you can see that these are the ones that um, Emma actually just took this past December. So this late stuff here, uh, she's got a photo of her hand there. This wheat has just germinated. We can see this early and even the mid early, just how much canopy closure, how much tiller development is there compared to those late planting um, timings. And so she looked at planting date, but she's also looking at the different management regimes that we tend to use in the province. So we've got a standard, which is our 120 kilograms per hectare of N plus sulfur and only one fungicide. And then in our intensive, we upped that to about 170 total applied uh, and in a split uh, nitrogen approach. We've also got a plant growth, growth regulator on there. And then she also looked at multiple fungicide timings instead of one. So those are the things that um, she's comparing. 
for the soil or the, the soybean desiccation piece, uh, she's got two locations again. She's looking at four maturity groups, uh, different herbicide timings for those, and, and three different herbicides. And so she's got one year's results. And so far, we've found that planting day obviously has a significant effect on yield, but also yield components. And some of the trends she was seeing are quite similar to what we actually found in the end. Uh, she found that Dequat or Reglone um, might, might be a good option for advancing soybean harvest maturity. So this photo here on the right was actually the, the Reglone application. And you can see compared to the soybeans around it, or even to this other photo, because these are on the same day, just how much quicker um, those soybeans are, are ready to go for harvest. And so uh, on average, you know, a seven day increase in soybean harvest maturity results in a, you know, half of a, half of a, metric ton per hectare yield increase. So it, it's pretty significant. Um, so this project is going to continue into 2022. So this year, so we'll have some, hopefully some great results on that. But I think I just would highlight that, you know, if you're a grower who's looking for, you know, areas that you could really focus on to in, improve your, your yields, your wheat yields, but also your profitability, I really think that seeding date and establishment is, is the easiest, most cost-effective, low-hanging fruit um, that we can, you know, go after in terms of pushing wheat yields uh, in the region. And so with that, uh, I'll take any questions. I guess for anyone who is interested in the yen, I'll just note, um, we do have a website. It's uh, just the www.greatlakesyen.com. So you can go there and get more information about the yen. It's also a place that you could register if you are interested in participating. And then for um, any information on some of these projects that I talk about, like the drill demo and MS projects, uh, we, we keep those up on Field Crop News. So you can check that out as well. And um, I'll leave it at that and I'll take any questions that folks might have. Yeah, Joanna, fantastic. A lot of, lot of great work going on. I just wanted to, to, to comment on the Yen program. So I went up to visit Dennis up at Michigan State this last spring and oh, uh, kind of walked me through the, the project. and. The agreements I had with Dennis that we were going to start a, pro a pilot project here in New York. And so we agreed on five growers uh, from New York. And I have those five oh, growers. Yeah, I set those up last year uh, with folks before we'd actually went in. So I do have the maximum on that yen, you know, for our pilot project this year. So what I hope is work with these five growers. I mean, taking the data one on one, like you said, and seeing how that goes. and you know, maybe uh, we'll be able to open it up next year to more participants. So that's where we sit with the end. So excited about that because uh, it's shown some great detail and I would look through some of the Michigan uh, data with, with Dennis. And so it's, it's nice to be able to have a project that can identify your holes in production. And like you said, where can you move that yield in the right direction to, you know, its capacity. So it's a fantastic program. And yeah, I hope that we show some good data and continue. Uh, one That's question good. I had real quick on, you keep mentioning, you know, program, uh, PGRs. I mean, Palisade is one here that more and more growers are using. Are you uh, using any additional uh, growth regulators up there? Yeah, so we got registered. Uh, manipulator was just registered. Clonoclot chloride was just registered in, I want to say this 2019. And then we also got... Um, uh, oh my gosh, Modus, sorry, from Syngenta. And so Modus and uh, Manipulator are the two primary ones that we use in Ontario. We previously had a PGR from Bayer, but that PGR, the challenge with it was the timing. You have very, very small window apply and you could create, you could cause some issues with it. So we don't tend to use that as much. We stick with uh, Modus and Manipulator. And I would say that 2021 was actually the first year we saw it being utilized on a larger uh, number of acres. Previous to that, we had some dabbling, uh, especially with growers who are from like Europe uh, and are familiar with it there. They were kind of the first ones to bring it here and try it out. Um, so we really only started to use those, I would say in a substantial amount of acres last year. Now, one of the things or the cautions, and I'm, uh, we learned this ourselves this year, is that PGRs have 
a limit. So in, in some cases, they will you know, reduce the amount of lodging or delay the amount of lodging, but they won't necessarily totally eliminate it. So like in my drill demo pot, for example, we, we applied it at the right time, grow stage 31, because there is that wider window. Like we, so we applied it at the right time, but we found that with the history of manure and the soil test levels, the nitrogen we applied was just too much. And we even used the shorter variety. Um, so it, PGRs, if you're going to play around with them on your farm, I would encourage a couple things. One, I would encourage you to try them on multiple varieties because the variety, the variation amongst varieties is, is pretty significant. And we found that in a project that's on, and I wish I now had talked about that too. Uh, we do have a PGR project with Dave Hooker and uh, Peter Johnson, and we're seeing a variation amongst varieties. So if you've got a variety with good standability, you know, and you're pushing nitrogen, that PGR is going to hold it. But if you're really pushing nitrogen with a variety that it doesn't have as great of standability, you really need to couple that with split nitrogen too. You can't just depend on a single application pass. So definitely try it on multiple varieties and just try some strips with different nitrogen um, management practices. So, you know, try a single application, but then compare that with the split nitrogen application and, and play around with them a bit before you start to putting it out on all of your acres, because there are some nuances with them. I think they're great, excellent tools, but start with selecting a variety with good standability, select or use split nitrogen applications in in um, partnership with PGRs, and I think you'll you'll get much much better standability overall, rather than just trying to rely on a PGR to hold everything up. That's good advice because, like you said, it's not going to eliminate. And many people that use it say, "Well, I didn't see it the size come down at all." And I guess you got to remember that it also is is thickening the cell wall of the, of the stem. Yes, which we cannot see with the naked eye. <laughs> no, so. exactly. And if you can delay the onset of that lodging, that's huge because depending on when your crop lodges, like I know with CNM Seeds, they're a seed company here in Ontario. They had some plots lodge right at right after flowering, like with two to three days after, and they had twenty bushel loss compared to those plots that lodged further in through grain development. So if you can delay that lodging, you know, you're already winning. I know nobody wants to combine lodged wheat, but you know, don't fret too much if your crop is lodging, you know, well into the grain fill period because you've still optimized yield. But if, you're, if your crop is lodging essentially at anthesis, then that's when we start to get um, a little bit higher yield losses. Sure, sure. So that was one of the questions and I think we answered that one. Uh, another one up here is, do you think wheat ground that has a history of manure has a high risk of having disease in the wheat on wet years? <laughs> so I don't know if Gary's still on here, but Gary might have to jump here and help me on this. But I would say yes. Uh, I think if you've got history of manure, uh, especially if you've got lots of residue there, it, it can bring that on more. So I know for us, we saw a lot of powdery mildew. A lot of livestock producers actually saw powdery mildew this year. And, and so Gary, I don't know if you've got any comments on that. Maybe it's the type of rotation we're in, but um, yeah, I, I don't know, Gary, do you've got some thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, I would just, you, you know, I don't know if there's a generic answer to that, but, but some of the uh, root and crown rots might be aggravated with uh, very high soil nitrogen there. I think it's more about the level and the growth stage, but uh, I don't, I don't know that there's a generic answer to that question, Joanna. So yeah. <laughs> we have very high nitrogen in that in the early growth stages. It would be conducive to more powdery mildew. I, I, I certainly agree with that. I, I wanted to just slip in one quick comment or really question, but in uh, when you're talking about lodging and, and Mike can uh, jump in on this too, but uh, we've been seeing in recent years that a lot of the late season lodging that's right at the soil line is really associated with either fusarium uh, uh, foot rot or, or eye spot disease. And I'm not sure that uh, the, the plant growth regulators are gonna have a great impact on that, but uh, it's just something to note when you're, when you're seeing a lot of lodging, not that early stuff you're talking about, the, but the after a storm, and those are usually also associated with quite a few premature whiteheads or poorly filled heads. 
Yeah, we definitely, um, I would agree with like, if you've got more of that disease pressure, your crop is absolutely more likely to lodge. And we actually saw that with, I did a project in oats this year as well, looking at different tank mix combinations. And if you've got high crown rust pressure, that crop is so much more likely to lodge, even in our performance data for Ontario, we actually break out the lodging and crown rust data on its own because the crown rust has such a huge impact on lodging. So if you've got that, those diseases, those root diseases there, and some of those other leaf diseases breaking down that, that plant tissue, yeah, you're absolutely going to be at higher risk for lodging too. Great, great conversation. Um, and we're right on time. So Joanna, <laughs> I appreciate uh, all, all your, your last 60 minutes with us here today. I know the growers appreciate it. And I hope uh, we can stay in touch and maybe I'll get a, to get to visit up there here this yeah, summer. Yeah, that'd be great. What, what you guys are doing uh, in Ontario. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much for having me. And if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to, to chat with you. All right, thank you, Joanna. Thank you. All right, so it is nice. We are we are right on time um, to finish to finish the last thirty minutes that we have today of day one of Soybean Small Grain Congress, and uh, our last presenter, uh, you guys are very familiar with uh, Mike Hunter, who is my colleague, um, you know my counterpart in Northern New York. Mike has done a fantastic job of taking over more of the the herbicide research. Here in the state, uh, since currently we, you know, we still do not have uh, a weeds, uh, you know, a crop weed science faculty member at Cornell. I think they're working on it, but nothing's nothing's happening quite yet. So Mike has uh, done a great job with that. Uh, he's kind of going to go over, uh, you know, some of his work with Mayor's Tail the last two years uh, in soybeans, um, and then uh, kind of, you know. There, there's kind of been some issues we had Bill Johnson on at Corn Congress talking about, okay, what are we going to do? How are things going to change for us uh, moving forward with, you know, some of the, the liberty, the, the glyphosate issues, you know, what are some other options for us here in soybeans uh, and how is, uh, how's weed control going to change for us? So with that, I see Mike is on board. Mike, I do not see your slide. You need to share slides. Yeah. There we go. There you go, buddy. All yours. I've got it on mine. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity. So we're going to finish up this next uh, 30 minutes here. We're going to run down some soybean weed control um, programs for 2022. We're going to talk a little bit, as Mike alluded to, how it's going to be different because um, it could be different, um, especially in light of some of the scenarios that he's outlined for us out there. And I know it's not... Uh, you know, it's not like um, people are unfamiliar with those uh, um, potential roadblocks and, and uh, speed bumps that we're going to have when it comes to maybe availability or supply of some of our particular herbicides. So today we're going to go over, so again, I'm going to touch on these herbicide shortages, a uh, little bit on the herbicide updates, uh, some of the label changes that we've had on some of the products that we're going to be using. Um, burn down options in soybeans, and then as Mike said, we're going to talk about uh, a couple of our tough weeds that we've been dealing with, the multiple resistant mare's tail, and then and tall water hemp and palmer amaranth, and share some data that uh, that we've done um, in the state. So what about these herbicide shortages? Again, as Mike said, um, we do have some inventory challenges on farms and at distributors and dealers across the state. And um, as Mike mentioned, Bill Johnson was on uh, the Corn Congress and he talked about the same issues that they're having out at, uh, in Indiana and the Midwest. So the shortages that we're looking at right now this winter and it's, I think, status quo um, from what we've been talking with, with growers and dealers and distributors um, in the fall through, uh, through this winter here, um, glyphosate, uh, glufosinate, uh, the Liberty, and possibly the Clethodum. Um, so we have some issues there. So we also have, not only are we going to have some shortages, supply challenges, um, we're also seeing higher prices with a lot of our herbicides that we're um, looking at. So we're going to see a much higher weed control cost this year. 
And then as we move forward, we're still going to see higher weed control cost. Um, even if these prices were to come back down um, and adjust themselves in the next couple of years, we're going to have higher um, overall weed control um, cost as we have some of these weeds, um, such as tall water hemp and palmer amaranth spread across the state, because now it's going to force a lot of our programs to, uh, to be a two-pass uh, uh, weed control program that uh, a lot of growers um, we have, you know, quite a few that are using a two pass now, um, but we're going to see that's going to be a staple for us to use um, if we're going to um, be successful at controlling those weeds. So we have, uh, um, so we have these limited limited supplies, uh, and I keep talking with growers and working with growers uh, all winter here as we're sitting down at the kitchen table. We're we're coming up with some of our programs for uh, for corn and soybeans for 2022. And really what we need to do, and I keep telling everybody is, is we need to have quite a few plans in place. Um, so you're gonna see that group or that uh, category of people out here on the farms. We have some farms that I've talked to said, look, I was proactive, I saw it coming. They bought all the glyphosate or any of these products that we mentioned um, in the fall, if they were able to get it um, ahead of time. So we do have some that have all they need for the 2022 growing season. Uh, I've talked to some of our, our dealers uh, that are suggesting that they're pretty good shape on, on glyphosate or feel they will be uh, to cover their, their needs. And then we have that group that has limited amounts. We have growers with limited amounts and we have dealers um, and custom applicators with limited amounts right now. And, and these could change and they certainly may change between now and um, when the planters hit the, hit the field in the spring here. And then we're gonna have that, that uh, third group of they don't have any on hand, can't find any, maybe going into spring, they may not uh, be able to allocate any of those products um, that, they're, that they were counting on going into uh, to the spring. So when we look at this, we look at uh, some of the strategies that we're gonna um, use, and it's gonna be what's old is new again. So we're gonna use a lot of our older chemistries. And we've been, these older chemistries are coming back. We're starting to see more um, as, um, as we start to deal with say mare's tail tall water hemp. Um, we're bringing back some of our older products um, that have been around for a while. And those that are going to try to reduce or stretch their supplies, uh, we have to emphasize that we want to, um, if you're going to do that, we need to scout the fields. We have to take um, advantage because if you're going to scout the fields, we have to be early because if you want to take advantage of lower rate options, we got to catch those weeds when they're extremely small. We can't uh, try to try to shave the rate down or use the lowest uh, labeled rate and find out that you know, my weed sizes are a little bit more than um, more than I wanted and not get uh, the control you were looking for. So we wanna make sure that we're using reasonable rates if we do have glyphosate on small weeds. And if we do use any glyphosate, um, anytime we're using it, we need to have other, um, other supporting uh, herbicide products in the tank mix, um, you know, for, for multiple reasons, including uh, resistance management strategies. And then there's gonna be cases that, you know, we can just keep the glyphosate out of the tank mix when we, when we don't need it. Uh, we have a lot of situations in the last several years that glyphosate prices have been reasonable, supplies have been ample, and it's a cheap insurance policy that a lot of people are just putting in a tank mix um, in cases that, you know, if it were taken out of the mix, it probably wouldn't change things because we do have some pretty good uh, tank post-emergence tank mixes that are out there and being used. So here's a question, and I don't have a poll way to do it, but I'd be curious if somebody wants to throw this in, throw a throw a, an answer out, maybe in a chat or a QA, and a maybe just a quick thing. Look down through that list that I have on here, and what do these herbicides, these soybean herbicides have in common? So if anyone wants to just be brave enough to throw out a guess, what do you guys think, you know, all of these have in common? And again, I wish I had the pull thing up. Any bra anyone brave enough to throw it in the chat or the Q&A? No, we don't have any takers. So I talked to Mike about this earlier um, this past week as we were going through some of the products. So, we oh, we got somebody in the Q&A. Can you read that, Mike or Nancy? says old technology there you go old technology so yeah older technology that's for sure yep. so so whoever said that's right on so these were all 
soybean herbicides, the inactive ingredients that were registered in New York State prior to the Roundup Ready soybeans um, introduction in 1996. So that's a pretty extensive list that we had on the screen. And corn, 1998 Roundup Ready corn is when we got uh, Roundup Ready corn. And so, you know, around 1996, when we started to adopt and utilize, you know, Roundup Ready soybeans, you know, that was great. It simplifies wheat, simplified our weed control. It was one product. We had a wide range of broadleaf weeds and, uh, and grass weeds that we had. We didn't have any residual carryover. It just made everything better, right? Greater adoption and no-till, it, it just certainly helped us there. And it provided many, many years of excellent weed control. Now, you know, as we move into, you know, recent years with the um, spread of multiple resistant mare's tail, tall water hemp, now in the state, palmer amaranth in the state. Um, yeah, so now not as effective to have it, you know, for the control of those particular weeds. So anyway, so again, what's old is new. Uh, yeah, what's old is new again. So these are a lot of these products that we're going to use um, still. And then if you look at it, uh, one of the things I had to do is uh, Python. That was uh, Python didn't get registered or named Python. We had that chemistry in broad strike prior to uh, 1996. Uh, Outlook, uh, prior to that, Sandoz had it, that was Frontier. And then Metolachlor was, a dual two Magnum was after 1996, but we still had the dual eight, uh, uh, ADC um, prior to 1996. So some, those are some of the older ones um, that we had. Uh, so that's what we have there. Updates, herbicide updates, uh, and list updates for 2022. Uh, there's been quite a few, uh, uh, changes um, could be some significant changes for some uh, here in the state. Uh, the big ones would be the biggest thing that we have right now is <clears throat> the emergence. Uh, this is the application timing. Now it's emergence through R1, beginning flower. Uh, prior to that, last year, we were able to um, utilize Enlist One or Enlist Duo um, through R2. There's no application of rainfalls expected within 48 hours or when soils are fully saturated. They've added a lot of nozzles to the list. Um, Enlist one can be applied to uh, Enlist E3 soybeans in all counties in New York State. Um, the one that may have a, a change for a lot of our soybean acres here in the state is Enlist Duo, which is the Enlist plus glyphosate uh, premix. It cannot be applied in um, Genesee, Seneca, and Wayne counties. So it's going to be Enlist 1 we can use in those counties, all counties, Enlist Duo, all counties but those three. Um, however, glyphosate can be tank mixed with Enlist 1 in all counties in New York State, including Genesee, Seneca, and Wayne County. Um, so it's, you know, that's a workaround for us here in New York State. Unfortunately, there are some counties um, in the United States that uh, have counties that show up on both um, restrictions. Um, where you can't use either Enlist One or Enlist Duo. So that's, uh, and it came at a bad timing as well. Um, you know, this was announced uh, beginning of January. A lot of the soybeans were already, you know, soybean seed was allocated. People had it planned. This is what we're going to grow. Um, so as of January 20, uh, 11th, rather, 2022, this is something else that we want to make sure that we want to make sure there's a supplemental label um, labeling that you have with you. If you have any old product from, from last year or some carryover um, in inventories, uh, same for distribution, or um, they have to have the revised Section 3 labeling on there. Those labels, the, the supplemental labeling or the new labels um, can be found on the Corteva website. You can also get uh, one of them. I saw this week, uh, NicePad, the DC portal, only had one of the new labels on there. And I don't remember which one, but they'll likely get the newest one. Um, here shortly for us um, that's that's going to be included. So that's where you can go for that. Um, Enlist applicator training is not required. Um, it's not a required thing. Uh, however, there are Enlist applicator training webinars that you can attend. Um, there's a link for it. If you Google searched it, uh, you'll be able to find those. There's also Enlist label update uh, webinars that they have, and those are going to be archived if anyone wants to uh, to view those. So I'd strongly recommend, uh, you know, anyone that's going to use Enlist. Again, it's not not mandatory training, but it's nice to go through that to see and review all these updates to make sure we're using those products uh, properly.
the dicamba updates uh, last year uh, there was there were a lot of changes this year the currently the the epa is not planning any regulatory changes prior to the 22 uh, 2022 growing season our registered dicamba products for extend uh, soybeans here in the state remain at uh, extendamax ingenia and tavium and just a quick uh, reminder that uh, the annual dicamba training re uh, requirements um, are there. They are up to date. They're available by all three of the, uh, the companies. Uh, uh, Syngenta, BASF, and Bayer have, uh, have training opportunities available, and you can do those um, online. So you're going to have an online. You can do live webinars. You can do uh, self-paced modules, and there may be some opportunities for some in-person stuff um, around the state. Uh, Paraquat updates for 2022. Uh, we're going to see uh, maybe a little bit more Paraquat or Gamoxone being used this year uh, in light of some of the shortages possibly of, of uh, the Liberty and, and glufos or glyphosate rather. Um, so the EPA accepts the accepted the final interim decision in August of 2021. So that had some label changes for 2022. It uh, basically just a few of the, uh, the highlights It increased label clarity on the herbicide labels, it limited the aerial applications. It requires rate uh, dependent residential application buffers. So if you're uh, making an application next to a residential property, um, you have uh, uh, distance buffers that you have to stay away from that's gonna be rate dependent. Uh, you'll have to check that on the label. Uh, they're requiring enclosed cabs or respirators for boom, all ground uh, boom applications. Uh, so if you're um, spraying, more than 80 acres in a 24 hour period and enclosed cab is required. If you're spraying less than 80 acres in a 24 hour period, enclosed cab is preferred, but a respirator is required for those applications. And just a reminder that there is that EPA mandated, uh, mandated uh, training required every three years for anyone handling or applying Paraquat. And that is um, something, it's, it's an every three year one um, to do. So rye cover crop termination and no-till soybeans. Uh, here's just a quick list of uh, what we'd be looking at. If we have the glyphosate, uh, that's gonna be our preferred product of choice for burning down cereal rye. Uh, it gives us a little bit uh, wider window to do it. And um, usually the number one choice that we have out there. Um, Paraquat can be effective. Timing is gonna be more important. We don't wanna try to use uh, uh, Gamoxone when the cereal rye is, has got a lot of height to it. Uh, so we wanna be out there early with that. And then Clethodum or Select, uh, if we're gonna do that, uh, it's before the rye is six inches, the cereal rye is six inches tall. Um, the challenges that we're gonna have there is that, especially for us in the North country, is that it doesn't work well in cooler weather. And I have doesn't get along well with others in the tank. And so it's kind of that sibling rivalry. Um, you put uh, Clethodum in the tank with, um, some of our, some, our, our oxens, uh, like the Canva 2,4-D, um, you know, and even Roundup, there can be some antagonism there um, in the tank. So a lot of times it's better to, uh, if you're going to use it for cereal rye, make just an application of the, uh, the clethodum on the cereal rye without anything in the tank mix. So it's, sometimes it's going to require a, a two-pass trip in some situations, and that's going to be our soybean option only. Um, we're not going to use that before corn because of our plant back restrictions. So rye cover crop termination. So if I have a limited supply of glyphosate, um, one of the suggestions might be to use, uh, or if we're gonna cut that glyphosate rate back to try to stretch those inventories that we have, um, you can drop the glyphosate rate back. And if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna bring it back, um, you know, from the, this would be like the power max instead of the 22 ounces, if we're gonna drop it down to, you know, 16 ounces, you know, if we're going to go less than that um, and try to shave it down to uh, 0.38 uh, um, pounds of acid equivalent per acre, um, we're going to certainly um, put an ounce of Sharpen to improve control there. So we're going to use Sharpen with that. And then we're going to include the 2,4-D ester um, in a rye cover crop termination. The 2,4-D doesn't help us there, but it's going to help with, uh, it's going to be another uh, thing to help with some of our mare's tail that would, uh, that could be out there in some of the winter annuals and broadleaf weeds that we'll be dealing with. Um, so if we do that, if we put, as soon as we put Sharpen in the mix, we want, we must use MSO. Don't, don't replace MSO with crop oil concentrate. We're going to use an MSO with it. 
And then we're going to also include the AMS with that. Uh, the no glyphosate uh, rye cover crop termination would be our paraquat, gramoxone, um, 2,4-D ester, uh, metribuse, and uh, tank mix. And then anytime we're using, I should point out, anytime we're using 2,4-D ester, we're going to keep it at a pint. Um, so that that would give us a seven days um, uh, prior to, uh, to planting the soybeans. So tall water hemp control. Um, this is the tall water hemp that we're looking at. This is tall water hemp in Palmer Amaranth, and we have both in the state. Uh, and those counties are expanding every year. I don't know if the tomorrow tomorrow Lynn, uh, Lynn Sosniewski from Cornell is going to be on. She'll give you the whole update on on where, where we're at with the distribution of that. Um, so the chemical control of Palmer amaranth and tall water hemp and soybeans, uh, basically the, the control recommendation would be plant extend, extend flex, enlist E3 or Liberty Link soybeans. We're gonna plant into a queen seed bed. And then this is where it's gonna come down to a two pass or a sequential herbicide program that's gonna be needed. So the um, standard's gonna be used a group 15 um, so one of our group 15 um, acetamide herbicides um, plus metribuzin or in place of metribuzin, you could do a Valor uh, or Fumoxazin uh, plus metribuzin. So we want to use a group 15 with uh, metribuzin and then include our group 14, uh, one of the Flumies in there as well. And then we're going to come back in post-emergence. And if you have uh, one of those traits in, uh, listed above, um, we want to make sure that we're applying it to the palmer of the tall water hemp before it's uh, three inches tall. We have to come back in to clean it up. If you have the extend trait, we're going to use extend max and Genia for Tavium. Uh, if we have extend flex trait, it includes the opportunity to, uh, to use Liberty as well. And the Enlist E3 trait, uh, it's going to be the Enlist 1, Enlist Duo, or Liberty. And then if we have Liberty Link uh, trait, it's just the glyphosinate or Liberty. So the dicamba drift on E3 beans, just one slide on that, just as a quick reminder that as we're using these different traits, we have to make sure we know which trait we're using. This was a picture I took on a farm um, in Northern New York. Uh, it was kind of an interesting one. We got to the farm and I was talking to the grower and he said, yeah, he's, this was uh, the cornfield next to it was uh, adjacent to this soybean field. He sprayed uh, Banville uh, or dicamba rather post-emergence on the, the corn and he says yeah he says he had a lot of drift he said the drift only went out 16 rows um on the field 16 rows out just took out the headlands and in that uh pass on three sides of the field uh took out the the soybeans and uh, we get walking down the corner there and i said well i said you have an issue there and really what it came down to was he planted 16 rows around the field with um with the Enlist E3 beans, none of the rest of them were extend, uh, extend beans. So you can see that the, the, over, um, the drift of the dicamba didn't, uh, didn't imp impact the, uh, the extend beans in that field. So it's just, uh, just a quick reminder that, uh, again, if we're using those traits, I know we have growers that are, you know, this was one of the few that I think that I've seen them in the same field, um, but we see different fields on the farm and people have to be mindful that they're using the right product on the right field. So record keeping is important. So chemical control of Palmer, Amaranth, and tall water hemp and soybeans. So if we're not using any of those traits, the, the Enlist, uh, uh, the Extend, the Extend Flex or Liberty, if you're going to plant uh, Roundup Ready or conventional soybeans, we're going to plant again, plant into a clean seed bed. Two pass programs going to be needed. You're going to continue to use that uh, group 15 uh, pre with the metribuzin or the Fumioxazin plus metribuzin. And then for the post-emergence, we're going to come back in. Our options are going to be use the reflex or flexar uh, post or come back in with prefix or warrant ultra. Um, that would be a really good mix, um, the, the prefix or the warrant ultra because you have a group 15. So you have that acetamide to give you more soil residual activity for the uh, water hemp and palmer uh, going out through the year. And then you've got the the flex star in that uh, in that tank as well, and then our late rescue treatment. Um, if if those don't uh, hold it back, our late rescue treatment is going to come in with Cobra. Um, so this is uh, just a few slides here. I think Brian Brown may have in the last couple of years he may have been on to uh, to share some of this. I'm sure Mike has shared this in, in some of his talks as well. 
this is a, um, a tall water hemp trial that uh, Mike Standard, myself, Jeff Miller, Menencio Fernandez from Bear um, worked with Brian Brown from uh, the Cornell IPM program uh, in, or Cornell Agritech in Geneva. He was the leader of the of the project. It was uh, funded by Farm Viability Institute. It was a two year um, project, and these are sites. Uh, these are the products that we used in the trials in 2019 and 2020, and we used uh, those uh, products. This was the uh, the pre-emergent herbicide applicator or the pre-treatments in the in the trial. You can see the first rate uh, we used by itself, no control, and metribuzin at five ounces. Then we had a warrant uh, Roundup Power Max. We had Valor SX. We had Valor XLT, Valor um, XLT is Valor Plus Classic. Um, and then we had Metribuzin with that tank mix. And then also used the Warrant Ultra and Metribuzin. So you can see that the Warrant Ultra, um, the Group 15, and the, uh, the Reflex um, Pre was, uh, was really good with the Metribuzin in there. That was a really nice uh, control. Um, the one thing I will mention though, if I'm going after, one of the pig weeds, the, the tall water hemp or Palmer amaranth, the only thing I, my only hesitation with using like a prefix or a warrant ultra in my pre, if I'm, if I'm in Roundup Ready or conventional soybeans, um, if I have a traded one, the Extend Flex, um, Liberty Link or, or Enlist, I, I, get, I give myself better options to come back in with those other products. But if I'm in a Roundup Ready, or a conventional, and we use the Warren Ultra prefix first in a pre. Again, we had good control there, but say we had, um, uh, you know, less rainfall, poorer control, have to come back in for a rescue. Um, our rescue treatment's going to be limited to just Cobra. Um, it doesn't give us that opportunity to come back in with that second application because um, we would come in with with like a Flexstar GT or a Flexstar Post. Um, we can't do that, and you can't come back in with a prefix or another application of Warren Ultra either. So, watch when we're doing that if we're only using Roundup Ready or conventional. Um, so, this was our post um, treatments in the in the trials for the two years. We had Warrant, which is Acetaclor, and then Roundup Power Max and Extendamax. You could see uh, 2019 not as good a control as they had uh, 2020. Uh, had better control, and then we had Roundup Power Max and Extend Max treatment. Uh, again, that was our total post, our no pre down ahead. And then we had our our two pass programs, uh, pre plus post. Uh, we had a Valor XLT Metribuzin, and uh, and our post treatment there was was row cultivation, and then we had the Valor Metribu Valor XLT Metribuzin followed by Cobra post. Uh, pretty good control there. And then again, we had, uh, you know, a really good program was the, the Warren Ultra Metribuzin Pre and then the Roundup Power Max, um, Extendamax had, had excellent uh, control there. Going into uh, um, some mare's tail uh, treatments, we have mare's tail, multiple resistant mare's tail. Uh, this was the, a picture on the right. Uh, I think I showed that maybe, maybe last year. I, this was one that I took that picture in 2020, the fall of 2020, and that was a soybean field. And I convinced the grower to plant soybeans in again in, in that same field in 2021 because that's where I wanted to um, do some herbicide trials in there to look at uh, multiple resistant mare's tail. And so controlling emerged uh, mare's tail prior to planting. It's uh, essential for a good start is we want to avoid uh, planting into actively growing weeds. So if we have any actively growing mare's tail, it's not a good thing. We got to plant into to dead weeds, uh, weather, mechanical problems, other issues, delay the burn down efforts as well. Uh, we can, if we're not into a no-till situation, we're going to use intensive tillage prior to planting. And we want to make sure that uh, that we're applying a residual with our pre-plant burn down program or separate no-till soybeans. And we also want to make sure that we're in there before this uh, mare's tail is four inches tall. So with uh, the kicker that we have with herbicide resistant mare's tail is that we don't have any effective post-emergent uh, herbicides to control multiple resistant mare's tail in Roundup Ready or conventional soybeans. Uh, so we're going to consider planting uh, extend, extend flex, and list E3 or Liberty Link soybeans so that it allows that 
option to come in with a post-emergent control if it's necessary, if our pre-emergent herbicide program doesn't uh, hold things back. So no-till burndown in soybeans, here's a couple of options. You could use uh, Roundup or Liberty if you have it, uh, plus Sharpen and Metribuzin. And another one, you could continue to use the premix uh, with Sharpen if you want. Uh, it's, its verdict is the um, Sharpen plus Outlook. Uh, it's a group 15. And then we have Optil, which is Sharpen plus Pursuit, a group two. And so just a reminder with, we're going to make the assumption that if we have mare's tail, it's going to be resistant, you know, a uh, high chance that it's resistant to uh, the group nines roundup. And we also um, have a high probability it's going to be resistant to our group twos as well. And another option would be the Chromoxone or Paraquat plus 2,4-D plus Metribuzin. And then um, in a no-till burndown, um, if you're not looking at, if you, if you didn't want to use the, or don't have the glyphosate or Liberty, or you had, don't have Chromoxone or Paraquat or don't want to use um, those products, and you're looking for a no-till burndown in soybeans, and you're not as concerned with the grass control, you could look at um, a Sharpen plus 240 um, plus Metribuzin. So that would be another possibility for, um, for growers. Um, but again, it's the weakness would be uh, the lack of grass control. Um, here's um, some of our data. I'll go through this. I went through this last year um, and I'll finish this up. I know Mike's looking at the clock and I know I am too. Um, this was our trial that we did in 2020 um, in Jefferson County in uh, looking at uh, mare's tail. So we had good rainfall within 10 days. I had 8,700s. Uh, these were our, um, the products that we used. Um, you can see we knew that um, Prior, prior work in that field, we knew that we had uh, multiple resistant mare's tail. And the same thing in 2021, I knew that uh, um, we had confirmed that through the screening trials that we did with uh, Lynn Sesnowski and Brian Brown and uh, knew that we had multiple resistant mare's tail in there. So it was resistant to group twos and group nines. Um, so then we used classic at an ounce or control sharpen, excellent control with one ounce, the sharpen metribuzin, excellent control, tri vents, um, you know, that's uh, a three mix. Uh, that one's got some metribuzin. and it's got uh, um, Valor and Classic that uh, worked out really well. First rate, similar to the Classic, it's a group two, didn't uh, perform well, which we wouldn't expect in this situation. And then Boundary, which is the dual two Magnum and metribuzin, excellent control. Our Valor didn't do so well at the two ounce rate. Now we used the two ounce rate here. I should have uh, mentioned that if we're looking at tall water hemp or um, yeah, Palmer Amaranth, the Valor rate would be three ounces rather than two. And then if we're looking at uh, Valor XLT, you wanna make sure that rate is four or five ounces. Um, so I didn't mention that earlier, um, talking about that. And then we have the Valor um, plus Metribuzin, excellent control, Spartan Charge, uh, that's sulfentrazone and carfentrazone. Um, don't really need to cover that much. We, we've looked at it in 2019, 20, and 21. We've looked at this, and um, it's not, sulfentrazone's not registered in New York State. We were told this fall, too, that the likelihood is not high to get it registered in the state. So we've ended our testing of sulfentrazone uh, moving forward into 2022. And then again, you can see just uh, Metribuzin by itself in 2020, we had excellent control of the mare's tail. Um, you can see what mares to, uh, what Metribuzin brings to the table on the left, Valor at two ounces, five ounces of Metribuzin, excellent control. Um, so this is our trial in 2021. Uh, that was the site that was planted June 1st. Uh, the pre was put on June 2nd. Rainfall, I don't have it on the slide, but it was just under half an inch in the, in the seven days after application. Uh, control, not so good. We, again, we knew this was multiple resistant mare's tail. Classic, it announced, not good control. Um, Sharpen, uh, not as good a control as we had in 2020. At the ounce rate, we put in the, you know, the Tricor or the Metribuzin at six ounces, and it brought that control back up. Uh, tri vents, uh, you know, not as not as good as we had in 2020. First rate, similar to classic, we didn't expect control. Boundary, uh, we have the dual in there, dual two magnum. We have um, 
the metribuzin in there, not as high a rate of the metribuzin in there, um, still giving us some control. Again, Valor um, SX, uh, pretty consistent with, with the 2020, um, not as good a control um, of the mare's tail. Uh, we put the metribuzin in there, it increases our control. And then down below, we did, you do see that there was a slight uh, response to, uh, to the different rates of, of metribuzin, the five ounces versus the 10.6. So really, um, it's gonna be, you know, start clean, stay clean, an effective pre-emergent program. Uh, we just, we just want to pre-down. It's not going to be dependent on the herbicide uh, tolerance trait. It protects from early season yield losses due to weed competition, buys us time for post applications, and reduces uh, weed densities for post control. Um, resistance weed management, it's not simple. We've got to manage like we already have it. We want to make sure that we're using uh, two or more effective sites of action each time on the targeted weeds, uh, especially, you know, mare's tail, saltwater hemp and palmer. We want to rotate our crops and traits and we want to carefully consider how we're going to best steward these traits. So I have, and I can open it up to any questions if there's time, Mike. Yeah, there's nothing uh, in the Q&A at this point. We're right on time. Uh, if you guys do have a question, please uh, put it you know, in the, in the question, in the Q&A box, or, you know, Mike can stay on a little bit and, and as we're finishing up sure. here, Certainly. or you can, you know, Mike has his, his stuff right here. You can, yep. you can call or, or text or email Mike with any questions as you think of them as, uh, as the day progresses or as we move forward. So, Mike, thank you very much, buddy. Always a great summary of what's going on in the weed world. And if you have Roundup down that way, Liberty or Clefidum, Mike, just send it to the North Country and we're looking for it. <laughs> I know we're getting lots of questions about that and the price increases are, are insane, but um, that's, that's where we are right now with the supply chain. All right, guys, well, that ends uh, day one for us.